the presentation right before lunch. So you can imagine the entire room looked like wet noodles, and it was before the, the cell phone, so people are flipping through their program, and they're all slouched down. And I was in the back of the room, and as I watched Brian get up and present, the room sat up taller, people started leaning forward, people were nodding, they were actively engaged, and I said, at the coffee break, you have got it. You have got the message. So we have lots of scientists that are great communicating scientist to scientist. And that one thing that Brian does so well is he gets people, behavior, what the science people need, policy, and their perspective, and the food industry and business, because we're all in this together. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Monsink. And you want to talk a little, too, about how you're going to run the show today? Well, thank you, my friend. Yes, yes. I'll give you an idea what we're going to do. We're going to start off talking about some, some studies that, that we've been doing. And some of these are in, in collaboration with people at uh, Cornell Weill, some are people at other medical schools. But studies that address, do we really know what we like? Do we really know why we do what we do? Because if we don't, there's an incredible opportunity for us as inventors of inter interventions to be able to nudge people one direction or another to get them to actually behave healthier without them consciously having to make that decision. So I'll talk about that for a short period of time. Then I'll move on to a, a, the topic of some of the cool things we're doing with what we call the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. And this is a program, free program, that we're rolling out across the nation. Already it's in 30,000 schools. And the whole goal there is to get kids to pick up the cookie, I mean pick up the apple instead of the cookie, all the while while not taking the cookie away and scaring them away from the hot lunch program. And then I'll end with some uh, reminders of some burning questions that you might, uh, you might have had in your life. Okay? After that, we can actually do some uh, Q&A. So here's my lab. Now, my lab's a lot different than probably a lot of labs you're cust accustomed to because we don't wear white coats. We don't have, like, bubbling beakers. We don't have a guy over in the, some crazy, crazy Russian postdoc in the corner with, like, really crazy hair. No, almost all of our people are social scientists, behavioral economists, people like this. So what our lab looks like, it looks like your house. Okay? <clears throat> all of the rooms in our lab can be transformed in about three hours to look like a restaurant, or to look like a bar, to look like a school lunchroom, to look like the inside of an M1 Abrams tank if we're studying how rations can be used to get guys, uh, soldiers, to cooperate better. We can make it look like the inside of an airplane. And the whole goal here is to take one-way mirrors, to take hidden cameras we have, to take scales we might have underneath tables, and figure out why people do what they do. So if, for instance, uh, the temperature drops in a room, how does it influence, maybe not how much calories you eat, but how does it influence the mix of calories? Or how does it influence what you eat first? Things like that. Because by manipulating those things and seeing behaviorally how people change, we can get a really great idea, not how to change lipid levels, but how to physically change an environment so somebody actually behaves in a way that's better for them and hopefully just better for public health. So I got a call the other day. Uh, this is a while back from the, from the Los Angeles Times. And I don't know if any of you follow the, the, the hot topics in school lunchrooms. But they did something a while back in L.A. schools that they said, you know what we're going to do? We are going to force kids to eat the escarole and the tofu. Yeah, that's it. We're going to get them to eat healthier by taking everything off the menu that they could possibly like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they did this for about a year. And then the, the, the figures, the sales figures uh, of what happened um, kind of finally, finally came in. And this person from the L.A. Times who I'd talked to in the past, Colin said, You'll never guess what happened. I'm like, I, people stopped eating school lunches. And she goes, how did you know? <laughs> and it, it's kind of funny, because what it kind of gets at is that our best guess as to what to do in cold, rational, well-lit room with our colleagues as we steeple, OK? It often isn't what happens when we actually go and deploy things in the real world. Weirdo things happen. Let me give you an example. This is just some research we just finished up a short time ago, and I'll take a departure from schools. There's a lot of interest in, in what happens if you tax soft drinks and things like this. Well, we did a, a big eight-month study in, in Utica, New York, of four um, 
major, uh, the four major supermarkets there, and we tax soft drinks. And one of the things we found, uh, by about 20%, one of the things we found is that for the first month there was a little dip in sales and a bounce back up, which, you know, it's not surprising. You see that in a lot of places. But here's what we didn't expect, is that after that, during that month and after that, in beer buying households, beer sales went up dramatically, significantly. And you push something like this, and you kind of go, there, that, we fixed that, didn't we? Something bulges out in the other way. And that's what happened in the school lunchroom. They said they took away a lot of the stuff that kids would typically be drawn to. And once you, we, they took those things off the menu, kids just said, you know, there's really no reason for me to go there and eat anymore. I'm going to do something else. Now, this is just observational on our part. But when we see people who don't eat school lunches, particularly in high schools, in high school, junior highs and high schools, when we see people who don't eat school lunches, typically they're not eating you know, the tofu and the yogurt. Okay? Their lunches consist of big bags of Funyuns and, you know, <laughs> you know, and wild cherry Coke or something like that. In about four out of five, or three out of four cases, we estimate people who don't eat school lunch actually in general eat worse during the day. I, we're not sure what happens when they get home, but um, it's not good, it's not happy news. And in trying to figure out what we could do to school lunch rooms, what we could even do to our own homes, because these principles will actually work in our homes, we wanted to look at two things. One is, do, do we really know what we like? And do we really know why we do what we do? Because like I said in the introduction, if, if we don't, and if there's a little bit of gray area, if there's a blurred line around that, what we might be able to do is set things up so that, again, we can actually be our own uh, governor of behavior. Okay. Let's take a look at this, do we know what we like? Okay. We'll look at first in our case, then we'll project it to the little gooblets. Okay. And, and again, uh, some of the stuff we're going to be talking about toward the end is all about stuff that can be done in schools, but every single one of these things has an analog in our own homes. Everything, everything we'll talk about in home in schools can be done in your home to either get your kids to eat better or to get you to eat better or to get your stubborn spouse to eat better. Do you know what we like? Well, we did this study a while back, and this, this guy right here, he came to me, and he was uh, in charge of all the cafeterias, uh, all the dining facilities at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, about 33 of them. Big, big university. And one of his, <laughs> one of his uh, I don't know, flagship locations that he was so proud of was this place where he was trying to induce stealth health by taking all the entrees and all the foods in that place and making them healthier. You know, making them healthier, but not really telling anybody. So, for instance, taking the chocolate cake and not using uh, oil in it, but using maybe applesauce. Or taking um, uh, the, the seafood filet and, and, and baking it instead of frying it, but putting some crusty stuff on so that people thought it was fried. Okay, cool things. The problem was nobody was eating at this restaurant. And it's kind of a, it's a, really a buzzkill for the poor man. And, and he said, geez, is there anything you can do to figure out how to get people to like this place more? And so one of the things we, we knew from a lot of other studies is that people's interpretation of taste is really super subjective. You know, it's the one thing like, you know, if, if, uh, if we were to go out for, for dinner um, and... Uh, you're, you and a friend are out for dinner, and your friend has an appetizer and goes, oh, man, this is really, really good. Here, try this. When you try it, what are you going to think? Yeah, you're going to love it. And even if it wasn't related to you trying to please your friend, you're, gonna, you're going in there kind of going, okay, yeah, I'm going to look for why it's good. But if your friend did say, oh, hey, can you try this appetizer? I, I, the, some of this is a little unusual about it. What are you going to think the second you taste it? You're going to go, oh, my God, they're trying to poison us. Because you know? essentially you're set up to try to taste something. And so you try to focus your attention, your senses on that thing. And typically we look what we find. Okay? Well, that's what we found here is that we uh, took <clears throat> these entrees. We took, I think, six target entrees. And uh, we simply renamed them. We, we gave them stupid, silly names. So instead of calling something a... Seafood filet, 
it was up in the menu for a couple weeks as a seafood lay, filet. We took it off. We brought it back on as the succulent Italian seafood filet. Now, really, it's just a, a dried out fish stick. Okay. In fact, it's the same dried out fish stick that was on the menu four weeks ago. But it's got this kind of bitchingly cool name. And what we find is that by giving something a descriptive name, even a little phrase in front of a name, you know, creamy or spicy or whatever, sales for these things went up by 28%. But moreover, after people finished eating these things, they rated the food as being better, they rated the restaurant as being more trendy and up to date, and they even <laughs> rated the chef as having had more years of European culinary training. Okay. <laughs> now, this is a guy who'd been fired from Arby's like, you know, a month ago. <laughs> but the thing is, there's no limit to this. We, even, we, we could even take chocolate cake, and this is like dried out sheet cake. You know, it's really bad. And we, we call it Belgian Black Forest Double Chocolate Cake. Now, it doesn't even matter that the Black Forest isn't in Belgium. <laughs> People go, oh, God, it's just, oh, it reminds me of Antwerp, where I've never been. <laughs> but there's almost no limit to this. So we've got this thing we call a research restaurant. It's called the Spice Box. It's open two days a week. People come in. They believe it's a training ground for new cooks. Because after all, every, they have to sign a little consent form when they come in. And at the end of every meal, they sign a little card as to whether they like the meal or not. But we don't care whether they like the meal. That's all just a ruse. The real reason they're there is for us to do things. So we want to see what is the limit of this? What is the limit of our expectations on taste interpretation? So we took <clears throat> about, about 117 diners who came on one, one cold uh, uh, February. What we'd done was we had, we'd ordered cases and cases of this, this, this inexpensive cheap wine called Charles Shaw wine. Cost two dollars. What do they call it? That's right. That's right. Fans, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Other fans. And actually, it is, it's not bad for two dollars. But we took the wine labels off, soaked them off, and we replaced them with wine labels that said that this was a Cabernet, that it was a um, New from California, okay? California, a place known for wine, known for grapes, known for you know, great, cool things. The other half of the bottles, the exact same one, we put a label on that said it was new from North Dakota, okay? A place less known for wine, okay? <laughs> the 50th state to commercially produce wine. And uh, when people sat down, we randomly assigned tables to different wine bottles. And the waiter or waitress would come up to the one table and she'd say, hey, you know, uh, hey, thanks a lot for keeping your reservation night, you know, with the snow and everything. Uh, we decided we're going to give people a complimentary glass of wine. It's, uh, this is a, a Cabernet. It's, it's a new Cabernet from, uh, from California. And poured everybody a glass and then took that bottle and just, bam, set it right in the middle of the table. So you, you, you're faced with a California. So for the other half of the tables, the waiters or waitresses said the exact same script, except they said, you know, thanks for keeping your... Reservation, as a thank you, we have a, a free glass of wine. It's, it's a new Cabernet from North Dakota. Put it down, pour it, put it right down there. Now, it's the exact same wine. It's a prefix French meal. It costs, I think, it's between 23 and 25 bucks, usually, is the range of those things. But what we, what we found is that there's very, very different behavior based on the, what people thought they were drinking. So that, that initial perception of the very first thing they tasted screwed up the rest of their night, okay? In the case of you guys, you kind of go, oh, this is some good stuff. You rated the wine is better. You ate about nine minutes longer. In fact, you ate until we kicked you out for the next seating, actually. Uh, you rated the food is better. And when we asked you at the end of the meal, as you left, if you wanted to make reservations for later on uh, in the upcoming three months, most of you did, okay? You guys had a much less magical evening, okay? <laughs> if you thought you were drinking this North Dakota wine, it essentially spoiled the rest of the night. You finished up and left earlier than these people did. You uh, 
actually, you know, rated the food is worse, rated the wine is worse. <laughs> and, and, and most of you didn't make reservations to come back. And in fact, there's one guy who, when they left, he said, well, would you care to make reservations for, for the near future? He, said, he goes, oh, no. He says, uh, I'm really busy for the rest of my life. <laughs> And so here you have something that should have no impact on you at all because there's nothing physically different between the two wines, but the expectation essentially twirled things out of control. Now, you know, we can say, well, sure, that probably happens to some people, but it wouldn't happen to me. This, this is the dilemma that follows all of social science around and all of psychology. It's called the fundamental attribution error. As we say, well, that might work for other people, but not me. You know, and maybe you're right, but uh, here's, let me take a look Rain at some other people. Smoothie. It's unbelievable how suggestible our taste is. I'm Brian Watson. To demonstrate that, Watson tricked some of our own staff, seven of 2020's college interns. First, he added some chocolate sauce to vanilla yogurt. Then he told the students, We're going to be doing a little strawberry yogurt taste test. Okay. On the table, he had some strawberry yogurt containers. If you could put your blindfolds on. The students put on blindfolds, tasted the yogurt, and then Wansink asked them to compare the strawberry tastes. I think they both tasted really strong with strawberry. All the students were certain they were eating strawberry yogurt. This one had a much stronger strawberry taste to it. Oh, it just tasted more like strawberry. <laughs> with this woman, Wansink tried something different. We're going to be tasting a couple different kinds of yogurts today. OK. He didn't tell her what flavor it was, so when he asked her to rate the strawberry taste... Honestly, I didn't notice it's strawberry. Okay. And yet, by the time I interviewed the group, she too had accepted the idea that she'd eaten strawberry. When you, like, follow up with a question like, which one is more strawberry, I was like, I had to choose one. They all believed it was strawberry. Actually, none of them was strawberry. It was vanilla or chocolate sauce. <coughs> Stop. <clears throat> what do you mean it can't be? But I, I thought I tasted strawberry. I guess also when I opened my eyes, the two yogurts in front had a strawberry on the box. I think you're joshing us right now. I do. Because I, I feel like the, there was definitely a taste of strawberry. No, it was vanilla <laughs> yogurt with chocolate sauce. Mm -hmm. But you thought it was strawberry. Why? It tasted like strawberry. I swear it did. <laughs> The moral to these stories, says Wansink, is that we are much less taste sensitive than we think we are. We don't want to really believe that we are duped or fooled by something as simple as the... See, and, and the powerful thing about this is that if, if we can get sort of uh, mixed up or sidetracked by, by something, by the cues that are around us instead of the actual physical experience of eating something, we can actually also nudge the way that we like uh, what we eat. Now, I, you know, I had an interesting experience uh, <clears throat> a while back. We've, we've done a, a lot of these sort of studies like this. And you know, if you get a little too close to your research, okay, when you actually find something, it's like, oh my god, I can think of 500 ways that I can misapply this in my life. <laughs> and I, they had lots and lots of dinner parties. And, and one thing that uh, you ended up finding is that um, we have people over for dinner, and instead of saying, yeah, here's, here's your uh, chicken, damn it, eat up. Mm. No, I'll find that simply by describing something or describing the way it was cooked or even giving something just a couple names make people like it just a whole lot more. Okay, it's, it is wacky. So we had a series of studies that came out about this and, and a couple years ago there's a, there's a, a, a British publication, it's kind of like scientific, well, it's called The New Scientist. Is anybody familiar with it? It's really, really cool because you know British people are so funny so it's really got this kind of cheeky, funny sort of way to talk about things. It's, got, it's a, got a nice sort of tone. And one of the writers for it kind of came out and he was doing a series of stories. And one of them was, was how to make your in-laws think you're a better holiday cook than you actually are. <laughs> okay. And it was based on some of the sort of stuff. And we kind of we, we talk about it. We, hey, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and we, we would talk about... Uh, how your expectations get biased, can, can bias your taste experience. And he's, at the end of the, he's there for like two or three days, and at the end of the time he says, he says, you know, he says, I think deep down I already knew all this. 
which is, I mean, that's the definition of social science. It's, it's something that's obvious once you know it, right? He says, I think I knew this. And he says, because he says, I have dinner parties all the time. And he says, it used to be that I'm a great, I am a great cook, but nobody would ever comment about the food ever. You know, they'd come, you know, we'd have this incredible dinner that I'd, you know, prep earlier in the day. They'd eat it and just kind of like, you know, pound down some wine and just talk, you know, as if, the, as if we're eating at a fast food restaurant. And he said, oh, what I realized I was doing wrong was that I had pre-prepped food, and so all of a sudden, you know, we'd, we'd have some wine maybe in the living room, and I'd say about a, a minute before it's time to eat, okay, let's go to the dining room, and I'll serve up food. And people kind of, would kind of go, well, that took you a minute to make? I mean, how good can it be? I mean, they say to themselves. So he said what he started to do was about 15 minutes before it was time to serve, he would get up, go in the kitchen, kind of just lean up against the counter, take a ladle and every once in a while whack a pan, make some noise. <laughs> That's why. Then he'd serve it. And people in the other room saying, oh my God, he's, he's been gone a while. He's working really hard because I hear noise. This is going to be a great meal. And he said that one little thing changed the way people evaluated his food. All of a sudden he said he, got, he gets compliments all the time now about some of the intricacies of his cooking. So it's really powerful, and we find it's not just that, but I mean, if you're if you really uh, having that special person over this weekend, just actually having a candlelight, using, um, using uh, little placemats, dimming the lights, having music, do the exact same thing to your food. Well, let's take a look at another thing. Let's take a look at, do we know why we do what we do? And, you know, the answer is no. <laughs> okay, that's just the short answer. But I'm going to take a look at something. Um, if you look back to the last time you ate sort of a buffet lunch, do you know why you did what you did at a buffet? No, we wouldn't remember that because when we ask people two minutes after they leave a buffet, they can't even remember where they sat. Okay. I'll take a look. We wanted to look at the question. Um, a lot of people say, you know, the only way you can eat at a buffet, not overeat, the only way to not overeat at a buffet is not to go to one. But the crazy th question is, why are so many people at buffets skinny? I mean, you could say, well, they're just skinny today. I mean, three years from now, and man, they're going to be the biggest loser. I, it's going to, they're going to be just, you know, they're going to be those little, you know, motor cart things in, in, in Walmart. You know, yeah, it's just hopeless, hopeless, I tell you. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I eat the buffets a lot, and uh, we find that at least a third of the people at buffets end up being really skinny, like Victoria Secret Skinny. We want to figure out what is it that skinny people do at buffets that heavy people don't. And I mean, you might say, well, they, they eat less, okay, or they eat better food. It's like, yeah, yeah maybe, but, but is there something else they do that sets them up so they eat less? Is there something they, else they do that sets them up so they actually choose healthier foods but might not even know it? Well, here's what you can't do. You can't ask them. You can't say, hey, so what do you do at buffets? Because they kind of go, I don't know. Or maybe if you push them, they'll say, well, I, maybe I eat less than the heavy people do. I don't know. So you can't ask them, but you can watch them. Okay? And so we, uh, all these studies have IRB approval. Um, so one of the things we did is we took 12 coders and we tracked about 370 different diners across seven different states. These were 11 different Chinese buffets in, <laughs> in seven different states. And we actually coded them on 70, 70 different variables. I mean, everything from the number of times on average they chew each bite to the number of times they get up to you know, whether they get dessert. I mean, just all sorts of crazy stuff. And you know, if you're basically a, you know, a, you know, nerdy scientist and social scientists, this is kind of like as close to being James Bond as we can ever get, you know? <laughs> and so what James Bond would do if he were doing this stuff is he'd have, he'd have a weight mat, you know, so that, you know, when you, when you stepped on it, it would register exactly how much the people had. He'd have this, this, this laser grid so that when people stepped up the buffet, you'd get how uh, tall they were. Of course, they're wearing shoes and wearing clothes, but you're going to get relative BMI measures. You know, you'd have these sort of these, uh, these uh, some, some 
like a stopwatch or something like that, 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 that and he'd have these uh, clickers that you can, you know, stadium clickers. That's what James Bond would do. Unfortunately, we don't have like a James Bond British budget. So, you know, we, <laughs> we just had to buy the cheapest stuff we could. So we bought one of these weight mats that you know, it didn't even register if a car rolled over it. It was just, it's, uh, we, had, we had to return that. We had these laser things, and after three nights of me fearing that I was going to burn out somebody's retina, we, I, I sold them on eBay and gave the money back. Um, we had these clickers that, we had stopwatches that didn't stop. We had clickers that, that actually did work. So in tracking these people, what do you think we found? What do you think is one thing that skinny people do at buffets that heavy people don't do? I'm not talking about taking less food. What do you, what do you think they might do? Yeah. Yeah, leave more on your plate, and they, they, they definitely do. What else, what else do you think they might do? Anybody want to just guess? Yeah, way in back. They, like, survey all the options before they yeah, you're exactly right. In fact, that is about the first thing they do. If you look at the typical uh, skinny person, um, what they'll do is they, they scout out the buffet. If, there's, if we've got plates right there, they'll go. They'll walk around the food, see what they like. Then they'll come back and pick up their plate, and then they'll swoop down, you know, like, like an eagle with a stir-fry eye and pick whatever they want. So they take what they like most. What we find instead, in fact, what we find is about uh, roughly 71% of, of the skinny people do that, but it's roughly 77% of the heavy people immediately go to a plate, pick it up, look at the first thing in the menu and say, do I want that or don't I? Then they look at the second thing and they say to themselves, do I want that or don't I? And it's a much different thing if you take your favorite foods versus you take anything that you can't stand, anything that you is acceptable. So that's one thing they do. Uh, another thing they end up doing is we find that on average, when, when they're allowed to seat themselves, the, the typical skinny people will sit about 16 feet farther from the buffet than the heavy person does. Uh, now why would that make any difference? Well, I, you know, I don't know, but it might just be the more convenient things are, the more salient they are in your mind. The easier to just kind of say, whoa, look at everybody going up. It's my turn. I don't want anybody to get the last of that peeking duck. Okay. We find they're three times more likely, heavy people are three times more likely to sit facing the food than skinny people. Okay. So heavy people sit close and they face the buffet. When there's an option of taking smaller plates, what we find is skinny people are uh, seven, almost seven times more likely to take a smaller plate than a larger plate. They're more likely to use chopsticks, and this is after excluding, um, after excluding people of Asian heritage from the analyses. They're, they're seven times more likely to take chopsticks. And here's what we end up finding. We've got a thin diner, sits 16 feet farther away, three times more likely to face away from it. She's more likely to sit in a booth, more likely to have a napkin on their laps, more likely to use a small plate, use chopsticks. And she will chew, on average, 15 chews per bite of food. On average, OK? Um, this guy's going to only choose, chew about, on average, 12 bites per food. Uh, he tends to face the buffet. I don't really think he sits that close, OK? I think the artist got carried away. <laughs> sits closer. More likely to use a fork instead of chopstick, more likely to sit at a table, more likely to use a large plate. Now, some of these things are just weirdo things. They're like, well, what do you want? I don't get it. Napping in their laps, sit in a booth. Who, who, I don't get that. And really, I don't think that has much relevance at all either. I think, I think that, ha that happens because it's, uh, sometimes it's less comfortable if you're a big person to, to squeeze in a booth and a table. And sometimes it's easier if you're a big person to put that napkin on the table than to put it in your lap. But you say, OK, great. If we're public health, if we have an interest in public health, we can go and we can come up with a little brochure that tells people, next time you can go to the buffet, sit far away, scout out the food, take a smaller plate, uh, use chopsticks. Okay. So, and that's typically what we do in public health. And we'd even do a bad job with a brochure. You know, it would even be unreadable, actually. Okay. <laughs> so. So that's one thing that we try to do. But you know what's interesting is the implications this has for somebody else who doesn't really care about whether we 
about how good we eat. And it ends up being the buffet owner. Actually, what's interesting about this is it was, I alluded to this earlier that when people leave the restaurant, we'll often say, hey, you know, uh, why did you sit where you sat? Why did you do what you do? And w again, what's amazing is most people kind of go, I don't know. In fact, they don't even really know that they did what they did. You say, well, how did, why did you serve yourself the way you did? And they're like, in what way was that? And this is the power of these little habits that set us up either to gain a little bit more every day or don't happen almost unknowingly to us. Because the same person who does this at the buffet, you know, I, I'm guessing there's probably things they do in their own home that lead them to eat a little bit better than the heavier person. I'm guessing there's probably things they do in their workplace that they're not even aware of. Maybe their candy dish is farther from their desk. Maybe they have a different route when they come up from uh, lunch than somebody else. But I'm just guessing there's small things that they've done that have helped make them slim by design. But something that's interesting here is, is what the entities, what the institutions around us can, can, can do to us to, to help. One of the things we end up finding is, let me back up. One of the things we ended up finding is shortly after this, this paper came out, uh, I, I got a call from a guy who said, he said, you know, uh, my, my dad owns um, some Chinese buffets in central Pennsylvania. And I know when I, when I say some buffets, how many are you thinking? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly, I was thinking maybe three or four or something like that. Some, some buffets. And he goes, you know, we think that there's some things we could do here to, to make people eat less in our buffet. Now, why would he care whether people eat less or more? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, profit. Right? There's a lot of food that's wasted. In fact, about 25% of all food in, Ch in Chinese buffets is wasted. And people put it in their plates and say, forget it, eh, whatever. And so if they, can, if they can reduce how much somebody takes, and maybe even reduce how much somebody wastes, you know, you're still going to be paying the same seven bucks to get in, but if you end up eating less food, it's like, ooh, ka-ching. So one of the things, they, they talked a little bit, and we talked about some things, and they, they did some pretty obvious stuff. That he, they were going to make chopsticks the default. You can ask for a fork if you wanted to. They are going to bring out smaller plates, about 9-inch plates, rather than the 11-inch plates they had. They were going to ask the, um, they're going to have their wait staff, the, the, the hostesses, when people came in, they would initially seat them as far away from the buffet as possible, and the only when the place started filling up would they put more and more people closer to the buffet. Right? They would try to get people to face away from the buffet. I, I, from what he said, that didn't really work very well because people basically sit at the table where they want. And then what they also did was um, to encourage people to kind of scout out the buffet. You, you can't say, please look at the food before you make your selections. People are going, what? But what you can do, you can put those plates in a really unbelievably inconvenient spot so that somebody has to go, oh my god, I gotta walk all over there, I gotta walk by all this food, and ooh, look at that, look at that. I wish I had my plate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then what they did, which I thought was really, really clever, is they um, took uh, these like fake plants and stuff like this, and they would often block the buffet off, but they have the fake plants. So if you're eating at the table over here, there's these fake plants, or there's a, you know, one of those, um, those like Asian zigzaggy things. <laughs> screens, and that's, <laughs> I knew it was a one syllable word. <laughs> then the screens that would kind of block some of the food so it wasn't just so vi visible and salient. And, and, and these are really cool things because essentially what they're trying to do is they're pushing people in the direction of taking less, eating less, not so they can be good guys, but so that they can make a lot more money. And so about, I don't know, three or four months later, this guy actually comes up and he visits the lab and stuff. It's four or five out, four hours from central Pennsylvania. And he comes and he kind of goes, oh, I ask how they go. So he goes, oh, man, he says, it's, it's going really well. But she says, geez, it just, it took forever. He said, I had, to, you know, I had to give up my family vacation to do this and you know, family without me and blah, blah, blah. I'm going, and I'm saying to myself, how could it, you know, I mean, look, you're making five changes to four restaurants? And what, are you, you can do that in a weekend. I didn't say that. I just said, oh, really? Why did it take so long? He kind of goes, well, my, my dad's got 63 restaurants. <laughs> I went, holy cow. So that savings, even for the restaurant, it, it ends up being, on average, 
about eight thousand dollars per restaurant per day uh, per year. So lots of lots of savings. So if we look at things, there's a lot of win-win ways that institutions people. Restaurants don't want us to be fat, but they want to make money. And there's a lot of win-win ways we can find restaurants, school lunchrooms, workplaces, grocery stores want to move us in the direction of eating healthy. And a lot of what I'm talking about today, the idea that we don't know why we do what we do, or we don't know we're very flexible in the way we interpret our taste, make us very amenable to being, to eating less and being slim by design. Well, I want to take a look at this. How we can use some of these things, just in the context of school lunchrooms, to get kids to take apples instead of cookies, and think that apple tastes good. Because I, I don't know that we're doing them a huge favor if we just outlaw cookies. Because they're probably going to find another way to eat cookies after school, and it might come back with a revenge. Okay? And I also don't know if we're doing any great life lessons if, we're not, if we don't start creating sort of habits of empowering them with choice. Um, at some age, so that when they go to college, when they perhaps go to college next year, they don't have to put on that freshman 15 in the first month. Yeah. Well, we started this thing called the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. And it, it started about, I had just returned from, from the government, and within maybe a week or so of getting back, the Commissioner of Health from New York came up and visited, and we, we talked about some things. And when he returned, we got a call about a week later, and he said, you know, this is one of his project managers, said, you know, what we're doing is we're going to give these grants to a few schools, uh, a few school districts in New York, just a test grant. We're going to give them all 4000 bucks to um, increase the sales of fruits, uh, increase the sales of whole fruits by 5%. The goal is, what can be done in your elementary school, your middle school, your high school, they increase fruit sales by 5%. Apples, pears, oranges, bananas, things like that. And what all these schools were doing was, was they're sub going to subsidize fruit. So instead of being 50 cents per person, per piece of fruit, they're going to subsidize it some, some amount of cents. And they said, the question was, how much do we need, how much do they need to subsidize or cut the price of fruit so that Kids buy 5% more fruit. Is it, do we have to cut it in half? Do we, just, do we go from 50 cents to 25 or 50 cents to 30 cents? How much do they have to cut so kids take 5% more? Now, if you think about this, kids aren't paying for fruit in the first place. I don't even care how much it costs. They're just kind of giving their card, taking what they want to. Mom and dad are paying for it, or the free and reduced lunch program is paying for it. They don't even know what the price of the fruit is. Okay. And so we thought, we went and visited these places. And let's take a look at, that's what a school lunchroom looks like. This is um, this particular school district that we visited. Is, uh, uh, it's uh, way, way, it's, it's like Lake Saranac. It's, it's way, way, it's like northern, northern New York. It's like pre-Antarctica. Okay, it's way, way up there. But here's basically what a school lunchroom looks like. Um, and you'd have something like this. And in the darkest, dingiest corner of this, you'd end up having a chafer pan with apples and some greenish looking pears underneath a sneeze shield so you had to contort yourself to, to reach this thing, you know, come back and buy it if you wanted a piece of fruit. Well, we said, well, this is going to be pretty easy. I think our recommendation is going to be, look, forget the price, just put it in a nice bowl and put it in a well-lit part of the line. If our taste is so suggestible, that if we put nice fruit in an attractive bowl and kind of go, wow, that looks good. If that's enough to get some people to try it, it's, it's got to work at least 5% worth. So put a nice bowl, put a nice well part of the line. Five schools did this. Sales of fruit went up, not 5%, but they went up, well, that's, uh, those for five schools, went not up 5%, but, a, but 103%, 103%, not 5%. And it stayed that way through the entire semester. Yeah. Um, two schools said, oh my god, that's just so obvious. It'll never work. People aren't that stupid. Uh, I'm not going to do it too. It sounds like it's a lot of work. A lot, a lot of work. Their sales went up, as you might guess, 0%. And then one school, 
It's just, yeah, I don't know. They just they didn't get the mem- they didn't get the memo or they weren't paying attention or something. Um, when we're, we're talking to them, and this is a conference call about two months later, just checking in how, how things are going, and they, they said, "Oh yeah, you know, I think we did this wrong." You know, and I, I mean, I have I have the world's most kind, fun-loving, incredible lab, you know, but these people are, are going. <laughs> You know, how can you get that wrong? We had, we had to put the thing on, on, on silence for a while. And then we took it off silence. And I said, oh, well, what did you do? And she goes, well, you know, we put it in a nice bowl, but, and we put it in a line, but then we, uh, we got an old desk lamp in a closet we weren't using, just put it right next to the fruit bowl and turned it on. And then that's it. That's it. People, you know, my people are like just screaming. Milk's coming out of their nose. They're crying. And, I, I you know, I put the phone in mute and after people settled down and, you know, picked themselves up off the floor, I said, oh, uh, how did that go? She goes, well, sales went up 187%. She <laughs> was like, okay, well, let's change this. Put it in a nice bowl next to a desk lamp. Yeah. <laughs> well, a similar thing happened a short time later that the U.S. Department of Agriculture called us within the same month. <coughs> Pardon me, please. And said, you know, we, we really want to push salad bars in schools, but the ki- problem is kids don't know what to do. And you know there's that saying, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, in, in a lot of public health, they think, well, we've got a, our hammer is we're either going to change the price, either drop the price, subsidize it so people will buy more, or tax it so people buy less, or ban it, okay? And... If, if all you can see is that one tool, you try to squeeze that as the solution to everything. And in the case with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, with, um, with uh, salad buffets, they said, we need to figure out how to get more kids to take salads. And uh, they said, We're, our question is, do we take money and subsidize, again, pay people to take salad, do we subsidize the price of the salad, or do we instead use that money to expand the variety, to maybe, you know, add a couple more items, like encourage schools to add like those little Barbie-sized corn on the cobs. <laughs> you know, and if let's take a look at your typical salad bar. Okay. So this is a this is a not an uncommon lineup for a for a middle school. Um, you know, people might come in the door up the right. This this happens to be in Corning, New York. People come up in the um, a door right there. They'd have your L card items here. You might have the, the hot lunch line over here. You might have a couple cash registers, and you'd have this beleaguered salad bar over here that's just there, just just sitting there composting the stuff that's on it. Okay, <laughs> it's like this big, you know, mulch on wheels. And you know, if you look at this, you kind of go, okay, well, what, what do we do? Do we uh, Cut the price of mulch. Uh, do we do we add the barbie corns, or do we take 90 seconds and move it there? Here's what happens when you move the salad bar like this. You got you know the, the kid wearing a you know his Lady Gaga T-shirt, his baseball hat on backwards, picks up pizza every single day he can, and kind of shuffles to the cash register. All of a sudden one day, whoa. He bumps into the salad bar. What, 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 where did that come from? And I got to, ooh, that's, ooh. Well, it's a decision day. You got to figure out left or right. You know, my head's hurting. Uh, he, he commits to maybe going left. He walks around and he pays for things. He does that for about two weeks. All of a sudden, on the second, on the, after two weeks, something that salad bar kind of looks good to him. He tries it. What we find is that in almost every school where we do something like this, and again, the layout can be different. The principle is the same. Sales sales will increase 200 to 300 percent within two weeks, and they'll maintain its, it'll maintain itself over the course of that semester as long as they don't run out of salad. Okay, amazing changes. There's no subsidy. There's no new Barbie corns. I mean, at some point they do this stuff, but it, um, they don't need to do it right away. And so this raises a bigger question: What are these easy, low-cost, no-cost changes? You know, some of them either just behavioral economics interventions that don't involve money; others end up being just basic psychology. 
What are these basic low-cost, no-cost changes that schools can make that won't get any pushback, that won't have anybody having to rewrite some regulations, local regulations, or having to take their chicken fried steak off the menu? What is it they can do that increases the good stuff people take, decreases the less good stuff they take? Again, you know, it's still probably USDA approved, but decrease the less good stuff they take. And increase overall participation in school lunchrooms. Because like I said, from our observation, the majority of kids who eat school lunch appear to eat a bit better lunch than people who are bringing their Funyuns and uh, Mountain Dew from home. Or, God, we've seen this happen a ton of times. And I, I really encourage anybody who does field research to actually be in the field, because you see crazy crap that you'd never imagine. Uh, we spend all sorts of time weighing plate waste, doing all this stuff. But we see people ordering Domino's pizza and having it delivered at side doors. I thought, ingenious. <laughs> You're brilliant. I love it. So this is the thing, because you, you take this stuff away, and you have escarole and tofu, and, and you think that's going to solve something? No, it doesn't solve anything except for the poor kid that can't afford to not eat there. Well, so here's what we did. How do we redesign school cafeterias for less than 50 bucks so they get kids to eat better? Get them, they take the apple, they don't take the, they don't take the cookie. Well, one of the things we did is we took just a lot of the basic research we've done in cafeterias, some of the things that we've done just with, with high school kids, and we said, here's, here's a hypothesis. If we were to make these sorts of changes, here's what's going to happen. Okay, like, so for instance, we find that regardless of what it is, the first food somebody sees, they're 11% more likely to take than the third food they see. Well, so why don't you put the first food, make it be the healthiest thing that's there? I mean, actually, I'll just a, a quick aside. We, uh, I was at an academic conference a short time ago, and I was speaking at it, and one of the things I requested was that I could do a study at the academic conference. And there's an all-you-can-eat uh, buffet, breakfast buffet, really, really good stuff. Um, uh, well, there's <clears throat> fruit, then there's low-fat yogurt, low-fat granola, then a cinnamon roll, okay? And then we had cheesy eggs, bacon, and fried potatoes. So three healthy things, three healthy things, three less healthy things. What we did was set this up, and these, this, is just, this is two hours after I gave a lecture on how cues around us, particularly I use plates as that example, mess us up. Just two hours after that. We had the buffet set up in two different configurations, either healthy to unhealthy, and half the people were randomly directed to go this way and serve themselves. The other tables on the other side of the dining hall were set up the opposite way, so that people, the first thing they encountered were the cheesy eggs, the bacon, the fried potatoes, and the healthiest stuff was down here. Now, it doesn't matter what you see first, whether you see the unhealthy stuff first or you see the healthy stuff first. It doesn't matter because two-thirds of what your plate is going to be comprised of is going to be the first three things you see. Okay? The people who saw the cheesy eggs, bacon, whatever, two-thirds of their plate, well, it's actually 70% of their plate, were comprised of those things. People who saw the healthy stuff first, about two-thirds of their plate, about 65%, were the first three things they saw. It was pretty easy to do. I mean, next time you go to a buffet, you know which line to end to start at. Even if you're going against the, <laughs> even if you're going against the grain, start with the healthy stuff. Once we need to find the bowl size and dramatically ends up influencing how much kids take. We've got something coming out in pediatrics next month on that. And, and all sorts of things like this. Putting a name on something, simply calling something, uh, um, you know, like a uh, uh, crunchy apple. Well, that's crazy. Calling someone a crunchy apple increased sales of apples. But we find that when schools implement this, it doesn't matter how wrong they do it, it still seems to work. I mean, here we go, a hearty vegetable soup, <laughs> <laughs> clam chowder, hamburger, large hot dog, grilled chicken roll. I mean, is that a verb? I mean, is that... Is that is, is that like, like a, a job opening? I, I don't know. You know. But it doesn't matter how mixed up these things are, they still end up influencing things. Well, let me give you an example. Here's something we did for, for one school. The masterminds behind the cafeteria redesign are Cornell University professors David Just and Brian Wansick. I wanted to know how they're going to basically trick teens into eating right. So what are we doing here? 
first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of the milk, put it in front so if a person's thirsty, at least they have the option of picking something up. At least they have to reach over the white milk if they want to pick up right. a uh, flavored sugared beverage. Step two, they took the pizza, which was the first thing in the lunch line, and moved it towards the back. And the veggies and the healthy bean burrito moved right to the front. Step three, they renamed the healthy food. We find that changing something as small as calling these mixed vegetables California blend or the big bed bean burritos increased sales by about 27%. Step four, they moved the fruit from a plastic tub into a pretty fruit bowl. And finally, they took the cookies and put them just out of reach. They're going to have to ask one of the food service workers to help pick it up. We think that's just enough of a barrier to keep some percentage of kids from saying, eh, whatever, I'll have an orange. The professors rolled up their sleeves, made their changes, and now it's lunchtime. Oh, there she's getting her tray. She grabbed a sandwich. She's getting an Arizona iced tea, I think. An orange juice. Ah, and she got the cookie. So, Samantha, this time you didn't get the cookie and you got a piece of fruit instead. Oh, why'd you get the fruit this time? Why, why do you think? I don't know. <laughs> this was an unbelievable success. Fruit increased by 102% simply by putting it in a nice bowl. The sweet drinks were also harder to get to, and Jane, Marcy, Richie, and Levante fell right into our trap. Last time they grabbed Gatorade, Snapple, and Arizona iced tea, but this time... But the water was just in front, so I just grabbed it. Sales of sugary drinks plunged by 17%, while purchases of easy-to-reach milk soared 46%. Whatever was easiest to reach, that was good enough for them, and that was enough to get them to change. Another hit, the Big Bad Bean Burrito, sold out for the first time ever. The professors say, on average, students' plates this time around contained about 18% fewer calories, and they made healthier choices. If we look at that woman who was asked, hey, last time you took a cookie, this time you took an apple, why'd you do that? What'd you say? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And this is the reason that these small changes are so easy to actually inter introduce into people's lives, as most of us... Most of us who think about food a lot still don't really think about it very much in the moment of making that decision. That's why we can be so easily swayed by what the person is doing next to us, what they order on the, off the menu. How we, why we can be so easily swayed by what the waiter says to us when we sit down. Well, so we've come up with a bunch of these, a bunch of ideas. They're all research-based that we recommend, and actually the USDA makes these things as, as recommended changes to, that schools make. So all these things can be done basically without costing schools really any money at all. Okay? So our, our goal by the end of 2011 was to have 3,000 U.S. school rooms implement this. We had, had about 4,000 by the end of 2011. By the end of 2012, it was 10,000. We had about 12,000. By the end of 2015, it's to have 30,000 schools make these changes. And already we're at 25,000. So we're going in the entire state of Michigan, um, the entire state of Ohio this next year. So it, it's really kind of cool because it's easy ways that health and wellness committees can get behind changes in the lunchroom without having a battle with some entrenched food service director who says, I am not taking X off the menu. You, know, you have to, we're not letting, I'm not letting go of these chicken McNuggets, these chicken nuggets until you pry them from my cold dead hands. <laughs> that's not a fight that's worth fighting. Here's how we're doing this. Uh, we'll come up with an e-toolbox, targeted changes. We're using state school nutrition associations, the USDA, and we've come up with some um, programs to train people who want to do this, trainers, and try to retrain extension people so that they can go out and be our eyes and ears on the, on the ground so that we don't have to ever leave. But what I want to emphasize, I know a number of you guys do field studies, and it is just so, I spend so much time watching kids eat in school lunchrooms. I spend so much time watching people push carts around supermarkets. When you're doing these field studies, it's so important to be there to see what happens, because otherwise, you kind of go, things happen, and you don't know why they're going berserk off. All you're doing is analyzing things in your desk. I mean, and, and this, this is a crazy example here, but we found that 
cookie sales didn't go down at all. You know, people still took cookies, and you're like, God, well, why, why would that be? Well, one of the things we found is that once we visited this, this junior high is that cookies were the reason most kids ate lunches. They were, they were home-baked. They were big. They are incredible. I, I limited myself to only two every day I was there. <laughs> so they were the destination food item. But if we wouldn't have seen sales move, we wouldn't have known why. Um, another thing we found in this particular case that vegetable, the sales of vegetables didn't go up. In fact, what happened is we moved vegetables to the front of the line. They dropped by about 32%. It's like, well, that's crazy. I mean, all of our lab stuff shows that whatever you put first, people are 11% more likely to take than if it's third. What's going on? Now, think about that. Why? And so we were doing the analysis, and we couldn't figure it out. So we rerun it. We rerun it. We cut it by boys versus women. Think about it. Why would vegetable sales drop. Every lab study we showed that it worked, but why in the field would, would it drop? Why would putting vegetables first actually decrease the number of vegetables people take than when they're toward the back? Yeah? Yeah, you're exactly right. And we weren't smart enough to figure that out, so we just would scratch our head. And it's only by visiting the and watching this stuff happen in real time, that you see that nobody picks out a vegetable and then picks an entree to match your vegetable. I guess unless you're a vegetarian. And most of us find the entree we want, and then we kind of then we say which vegetable was going to match what we just bought. But that's something we would have never figured out if we just if we didn't go there and stare at things and ask people questions. Well, in conclusion, I want to kind of bring this back to you, and then we'll open it up for questions about whatever you might want. But in conclusion, back to you. Um, I mean, if you look at my, maybe what might happen when you get home tonight, um, where do you want to sit next time you go to a Chinese buffet? Far away and face away, okay? How can you become a better cook in five minutes? Yeah, just give your food a name, describe it. Just say anything about it instead of saying, yeah, here's that pasta crap, eat up. You know, just give it, this even works for your kids, too, if you give something kind of a cool name. They kind of go, oh, really? It's, that's, broccoli, or that's dinosaur trees? It looks like broccoli to me, but you know, I, I'm, I'm in for, bro I'm in for uh, dinosaur trees. What do you want to put in your home counter? Fruit bowl. You know, you put a fruit bowl in your home counter, do you think you're going to take any more fruit or your family's going to take any more fruit in the first day? No. You're not going to take any in the first week. You're not even going to take any more fruit in the first two weeks. It's only after it sits there for two weeks for some unexplainable reason. That's when people start taking it. That's when it doesn't look weird anymore. It doesn't look some sort of foreign object. Yeah. But it only works if that fruit is within about two and a half feet of where you would normally walk. So if you put it over uh, on the table, which is not where you maybe normally walk, it's going to stay there. It's got to be really pretty much in the line of, got it. It's going to be gone. Back to your key thing, something like that. Well, that's what I wanted to talk about today, is to introduce some of these ideas of, psych of taking psychology and behavioral economics and, and moving them into a context where we can help people change what they do. We can change what we do without having to count, write a food diary, without having to say, must not eat gluten, must not eat meat, and so forth. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can talk about anything you want to. Any, any questions you might have about it? Sir, yes, please. Yeah, that's an ex excellent question. Uh, is there demographic changes? Are there differences in age and, and uh, income? Um, one of the things we find is that it, it works much better for junior high and high school kids, mainly because for a couple of reasons. First, there's more degrees of freedom in the upper grades. They've got, there's more foods that are being offered. They tend to have some of their own money. They tend to, they tend to be a little bit more of their own thinkers, whereas Little, little, junior, little grade school kids, there's not that many degrees of freedom. They have fewer foods they can take. They tend to be really, really 
I don't, don't want to say sheep-like, but yeah, sheep-like. And then, and we're less concerned about the junior, about grade school because that that's the one area where when mom and dad does give them things, sometimes they are healthier. They are pretty healthy. I mean, a lot of times they're not, but um, at, at that point, if mom or dad's making a lunch for them, sometimes it's actually reasonably healthy. Uh, by the time a kid gets to junior high or middle school, it's like, ah, oh, forget it. I've already given up on them. Eat what you want. And then uh, what we find uh, in, in income and stuff like this, um, what explains most of the variance there, I don't think isn't because somebody's, you know, dad and mom make less than $20,000 a year, different than somebody who makes over 200000 but it's because they end up being on the free and reduced lunch program. And, and that's, and the, where's the kid whose mom and dad make $200,000 um, is just kind of trolling through the lunchroom picking what they want and they're not limited like a, like a younger person. That's a good question. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, excellent questions. We've been trying to look at Cinda data to figure that out because this is kind of tough to track people after they leave, and it'd be nice. Um, most of the stuff we've done without grants, and at that point, if we track people afterwards, we're going to have to try to find some sort of grant to do that because this compensation thing, I I get very concerned about it because it's a lot of what people. That's what I like about Johns Hopkins with the systems approach, because the systems approach can say, hey, look, if we poke our finger in here, what pokes out on the other side? Let's not assume this is a closed system. And I think that's one of my fears when schools like, like LA, just the LA Unified School District, just takes all the kind of indulgent things off the menu. There's no reason to even eat there anymore. It's no guarantee that they eat better across the course of the day. The thing about schools, yes, yeah, schools have a different motive. One of the motives that, that they do have, though, is, is they want to get as many people taking um, full USDA-approved lunches as possible. Because the more they do, the more they get reimbursed for that. And that's, like, yeah, that's how they get profitable. And so a lot of them use these techniques to kind of push the items that will complete what somebody might otherwise take. So let's say somebody takes milk and pizza uh, or an apple and pizza. They're going to think of ways, how can we get people to take a milk, or I mean, pardon, an apple and orange to make that a full USDA meal. Because once it becomes a USDA meal, ka-ching, we get money from the government. And so that's kind of the way they use it. Now we find that uh, some, some places, some of the some grocery stores we we're working with, we're using, helping them use some of these principles because they want to sell more fruits and vegetables. And the reason they want to sell more fruits and vegetables is to say, well, wait a minute, isn't there more of a margin on, on Lucky Charms? You know, yeah, there is when you sell it, but not if you end up throwing away Lucky Charms because they spoiled. Lucky Charms don't spoil. Fruits and vegetables spoil. So you want to sell all of those you can because there's tremendous more profitability in selling fruits and vegetables over the course of their lifespan than taking them up to the day where they start wielding and having to throw them away. Yeah. Great questions. Thank you. Yes. But also waste. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Great question. She said, yeah, it's one thing to get people to take it, but, but are they eating it? Now we've got the, um, we've got two papers in a review right now that have been rejected from every journal you could possibly name. I think uh, right now it's uh, it's at it's under second review at Plus Medicine, so we've got our we're 
praying, we're burning incense, we're sacrificing goats, things like this. And, and it looks at this, but we did this in New York City schools. And so people can say, well, really, really, how projectable is New York City to the rest of the world? And what we find is we, we do these things, um, intake goes up, I mean, our, our sales go up, intake goes up, but also waste goes up commensurately. Um, much more so for, vet, for fruits and for vegetables. People take the, the fruits and they're much more likely to throw them away, but also consumption goes up dramatically. And we presented some stuff to the USDA because USDA is very concerned about that. And the next round of stuff they're looking at is how do you end up decreasing waste? Now I'll give you, this is, this is, a, this is kind of a, a, a neat topic. <clears throat> we just had a paper published a while back and you're, you're not going you're not gonna to believe something like this could get published, but uh, in the idea of trying to get people, kids, to eat more fruits. You say, well, what can we do to get people to eat more fruits? Well, if all we do is sit in our office and brainstorm and steeple together, JB, what about you? Cut the price. You know, make it mandatory, whatever. We're, we're missing the point. And so what we did, we went to schools and we'd watch what kids did. We'd talk to kids. And if you ask, if you ask an elementary school kid why they don't eat fruit, what do you suppose they say? I hate the taste of fruit. I hate fruit. If you poke a little farther, what do you think they say? They say, you know, it's hard to eat, man. You get stuck in my braces. My little mouth is so little, it's hard to eat that apple. I, oh, it's, it's a hassle. If you talk to uh, junior high and high school girls, and you say, hey, wh why don't you eat fruit? What do you think they say? It's gross. I hate the taste. No. They say, you know, it's it's it's. It's messy. It gets on my hands. It looks gross. And I want to kind of look kind of attractive, like I'm going, arr, arr, arr. And if you say, well, God, I mean, if that's what's going on, it seems like the real solution is simply cut up the stupid stuff. You know, and in fact, you, you buy those, uh, and they're like these fruit guillotines, uh, sectionizers, I think they call them. And they're, they're actually pretty fun. So we would go to all these schools and bam, you know, and you put the apple or orange or pear in there and go bam, and it just sections it. And what we found is when we did this, um, sales in, um, in, junior, or in, in elementary schools went up about 80%. In high schools or junior highs, they went up about 23%. And waste in both cases went down. Because people, it's easy to throw a whole apple away. It's, you know, but if you get like four quarters or something, you, people didn't throw so much away. And it's, God, it's so, such a stupid, easy solution. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I do that at home all the time, too. Since I go home, I just, just cut fruit right away, and I find it gets, disappears like that. Great question, great question. And that, it is, if anybody else wastes plate waste and does stuff, we have this really cool method. It's, it's just, we're just publishing it this next, uh, in the next issue of J-A-N-D um, about how to do plate waste visually. It's really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a question and a request. Uh, the question is um, the, the idea that you don't know why you do what you do uh, has potentially been forcing and drawing the cases for health and public health beyond this topic we're talking about. So many of the um, health data that we deal with are stuff from you know, common use to cleaning to taking your medicine to smoking. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so this idea that people don't really know why they do what they do, um, it, it, can, it, can, it, it has a couple of implications. One implication could be from some people say, well, then we must tell them what they should do. You know, we, we, must, we, we must force them in that direction. Another view is we should just sort of set the environment up so people still have some freedom and they can kind of do what they want to do. Because in this case, once you tell people, 
they kind of go, yeah, yeah, great, okay, great. I see that happens to other people. I don't think it happens to me, but um, I'm not going to change. In fact, we find when bartenders, we did this, I, I lived in I was a professor at uh, the University of Pennsylvania for a few years, that when we give bartenders short wide glasses versus tall skinny glasses, they pour about 30% more liquor in a short wide glasses and tall skinny glasses of the same volume because they don't compensate for the width. You know, they're looking at the height, they don't compensate. But even after we show them that they do this, and even after we say, look, you poured 30% more, we ask them to do it again, within two minutes they still pour 20% more. Because okay. this stuff's really, really hardwired. And I think it has implications far beyond. I'm doing some work with, a, with, a, with the military right now, and one of the things they're trying to look at is there's been this terrible thing happening with uh, a lot of um, um, uh, like, like sexual harassment and kind of rape among, with, among our own troops when they're in downtime and they're trying to figure out what would be the way to solve that. And it's the, some of these same principles that we see here end up being relevant in that case in terms of reframing sort of the situation of these soldiers that in certain ways there, and I can talk more about that if you're interested. So I, I think this has implications in a lot, in a lot of other cases because these are just basic principles of behavioral economics changing the convenience, the attractiveness, and the normativeness of things so that people kind of go, oh yeah, that's not weird to do that. Oh yeah, that's really convenient to do that and not this other thing. Well, it's really convenient for me to put the seatbelt on, things like that. And then I, I think the idea that as experts we get messed up, um, I, that, that, that buddy you saw there uh, a while back who, had, who was in charge of the cafeterias, he got a, his, he was promoted to um, associate professor and I, we had this big, big, big um, tenure party for him. We invited like all of the nutrition faculty, all the PhD graduate students, all the food science faculty to this celebration party for him. Now, um, but I wasn't going to waste the opportunity to collect data, so, so, <coughs> so the, way, the way we'd set things up was we had all sorts of ice cream bowls and our ice cream uh, tubs and stuff. And when people came in, they were, uh, you know, people kind of sporadically came in, like, like, like they would for a reception. They sporadically came in, and uh, we would randomize the groups as they came in, or the individuals when they came in, to give them either like a large bowl, I think it was like a 24-ounce bowl, or we gave them a 16-ounce bowl, I think. Okay. Big and a little less big. Okay. But in no case would anybody fill the whole thing up. We gave them these bowls, and uh, then what also happened was at random times during the day, during the time, we either used a really big scoop, I think it was a three, a three ounce uh, ice cream scoop, or a two ounce ice cream scoop. And one of the things we found out is that if people both had a big scoop, if they, if they had, a big, had a big scoop, they'd serve about 14% more than if they had a slightly smaller scoop. If they had a big bowl, they'd serve about 37% uh, more, 37% more, I think. Uh, if they had a big bowl. If they had both, it was about 51% more they would serve. But at the end, we had them fill out this little questionnaire about how many calories they thought they took and this and this and this. And even these nutrition science professors who we think about this all the time, they, they, they've seen, I don't know, half a dozen of my different seminars over the years. Even they ended up being tremendously biased by this sort of stuff, even though they were the experts. And with them, though, when you say, hey, do you think you took uh, any more because he had a bigger bowl, they go, yeah, 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 yeah I, I realized what I was doing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I experienced any what? Uh huh. Oh, very good. Would they have challenges from the committee? 
You know, the, the strange thing is, and I, you know, I, I only came up to this realization a short time ago, but when I was younger, I, I'd always, I, it was one, of my, was one of my goals. I, I wanted to have a, a PhD student for every year I was in the field. So if, if I end up being a professor for, let's say, 35 years, my goal is it would be great to have had, had 35 PhD students. I've had two PhD students my entire life, and none of them did anything related to food. And the only reason I, they were my students was they were falling between the cracks. And I said, holy cow, I've been there. Let me grab your hand and pull you up. Because the thing is, people who are really, really good PhD students, they don't want to do some fringe area like eating behavior. They want to just be pure behavioral economics. Or they want to be pure... Uh, cognitive or social psychology. They want to be pure consumer behavior. They don't want to be in this gray zone. So I, I, I've never had any PhD students that's ever passed the qualifying exam ever come to me and say they wanted to work with me. Um, it, yeah, that's right. yeah. they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come and I'll, I might involve them in studying, they might, might get in a paper, but it's just it's like tangential to what they want to do. In fact, they don't even want to admit to their committee that uh, you know, that they're doing something on the side. And I, and I think that's, in some ways, it's kind of a, I think it's a tragedy, because a lot of them end up finding topics that are really, that are, are deemed really great and cool, but they, they don't really like them. Some of them don't finish their PhD because they get burned out about it. They finish the PhD, but they don't, don't go into academics because they say, God, I've had enough of this. Or they go into academics and they say, I'm not finding this very meaningful or fun. So I, I, it's, it's unfortunate. I, 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 I've had much better luck with postdocs because postdocs say, God, I can do what I want. Thank God. And so I've had unbelievable luck with postdocs. So, sir? Well, that's how I knew. Uh, you know, Bob is very serious talent in public. He likes to have a tolerance to this kind of thing. Uh, so I Yeah, it, uh, it is. And one thing that I, I, the funding didn't come very regularly until just a few years ago, but a lot of these things are really cheap to do. Like lab studies are really cheap to do, and you say, ah, what, what that? I, I pay $300 for, for, for this sort of stuff. Great, I can pay it on my pocket. It's better than waiting for a grant to come through. But the two things I found that have worked really well and that might work well for you, for you is <clears throat> um, <clears throat> international postdocs. We, we encourage international people, they want to come over. And, and, and be a visiting scholar for even just three months, we find we get tremendous benefit out of them, and they get tremendous benefit out of coming over just because they get involved in a lot of stuff. And then postdocs, I think, I have, with, with, I, I have had this unbelievable good luck with, with postdocs because they really want to work. They're, they're not constrained, like we, we talked about, to their disciplinary boundaries. And they say, every publication I get, every mention I get, in the news, every dollar I get in the grant is going toward my future. So they are tremendously motivated. And I, well, I have them over for dinner all the time. It's, it's really powerful. It's, it's, I think it's, it's a model that in an interdisciplinary group like, like Johns Hopkins, I think, it would, it would seem to me to be really a, a great model for some of the units here, too, of postdocs. Way back. You know, n not the menus in the internet restaurants. Uh, we we've done some with a fast casual, and I'm working with McDonald's on, on some of these on some of these things related to the, their their menu boards. Um, I uh, actually it was interesting. <coughs> was um, I spend most of my summers uh, in 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 the a in Asia because it's too far to go and when you're teaching. And one of the things I worked with a, a Burger King franchise in Taipei and said, hey, what about uh, rearranging sort of the stuff so that uh, the healthier stuff's at the top? And they, they go, yeah, OK. I'm like, well, that was easy, wasn't it? <laughs> and, and so they just put all the healthier stuff toward the, toward the top. Um, starting, they put water at the top, for goodness sake. Um, 
And, and I think we can ask them to do that, and we can encourage them to do that if it's the higher margin stuff that they make money on. Yeah, they're, 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 that's what they're more interested in. And I, um, I, I think that's a great thing that we can do is to ask, ask them to help us eat better because, again, they just want to make, they want us to eat there, not at uh, Carl's Jr. You know? Good, that's a great question. Yes? Yeah. Oh man, that's it. and for anybody who does field studies, this is one of the we we've we do a lot of field studies, and this isn't school entrance, but we learn this in other contexts that you almost don't want to measure anything the first two weeks after you make a change because you're either going to be unmeritously happy, like oh my god, it's a five million percent increase, you're high fiving random people across campus. <laughs> Or what happens is, is just people freak out. They don't touch it, and it just molds. Okay, so it's one extreme or the other. It's like, whoa, a change. Don't like change. And walk around it. So we find it takes about two weeks for anything to sort of dampen out. But with almost all these changes, what we find is that they will they will stick for a while, and then they start to trail off at about a two month period. A little less effective. And so what we find that needs to be done is there needs to be another change that's brought in at that point. But the nice thing about these school lunchrooms is they they be really hesitant about making the first couple changes, but once they do and they see an effect, they're really quick to try something else. Yeah, that's great. Yes, yes. Well, first, I think the, the owner of those little bodegas, or whatever they are, has to realize, what, what's he making more money off of? Is he, is he making more money if he sells an apple, or is he making more money if he sells potato chips? So I would encourage him to raise, if he must, raise the price of apples so it's in his best interest to sell more apples. But then I think I would encourage him to actually put those things right next to the cash register, have bundle deals, have um, a sign next to it, and, and really push those. I'm, I'm guessing where the apples and bananas are are probably nowhere near as close as where the chips are. Yes, sir. I, I will, thank you. Well, the first thing I, I think we want to kind of keep in mind, and this is why Anne's become such a dear friend over the years, is it's really hard to do anything related to food and make any sort of change if we say, well, I'm just going to do it as a lone wolf. And there's working in groups and saying, okay, now we're working as a group, um, and I'll tell you when I need you. But it's another thing to actually try to build these connections and try to see where they can move more organically. And that's why Anne and I have known each other a long time. And I use that to segue into, into government. That one thing that I learned in government is that there are um, four types of no. Okay. There's there's no. Don't bother me because I don't have time. There's no because we've never done it that way before. Or we did it once and it didn't work. There's no because I would have to ask my boss and I don't want to do that. And then there's no because it's illegal, okay? <laughs> and, and all of those, let's say even no because I'd have to ask my boss, that, that could be the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture who you're asking. He says no, and he's saying because I would have to ask somebody higher. Okay? It's, it, and I, with all of those, the first three things can be overcome if you have the tenacity. And there's, a, there's an expression I heard once time, and it's, 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 the expression is, there are 99 roads to Rome, okay? meaning there's 99 ways to get something done. I, I used to have a girlfriend who said, 
There's 99 ways to get what you want, which I thought was a little bit. <laughs> but you know, but, but she's right. But what do most of us do? We try two ways. I mean, if we, the first two or three don't work, we can't go, ah, well, whatever. I guess it's, uh, it is what it is. <laughs> I don't have to do anything now. But we don't explore the other 96 things. And that's what I learned in government is that, first of all, no never means no in government unless it's illegal. It just means they don't want to help you or they don't want to help make it happen. So you've got 98 other ways to try to do it. And that's what people don't do. I mean, that's the same way, you know, if you look at really super successful researchers, the, the people you kind of go, how in goodness name do you do that? I, the difference between that woman over there and this guy over here who is just as smart or maybe even a little bit smarter in some ways has nothing to do with intelligence because this person says, okay, well, that just got rejected from the 17th journal. Time for lucky number 18. <laughs> and you know, they never have an unpublishable paper, and I think they just keep it, keep it going. And that's what I encourage. There are 99 ways to get something done, whether it be that project you say, God, how do I solve this stupid thing? Whether it be the paper that's getting rejected, whether it be trying to come up with an intervention. The first two or three ways probably might not work, but that's when most people just give up. They kind of go, well, it is what it is. I'm going to go do something else now. So I'd really encourage you to explore those other 96 ways. And thank you very much, my friend, for, for bringing me out here. And thank you very much.